Hello and welcome to this talk on wearable photoplethysmography devices for cardiovascular monitoring. During the course of this talk it's expected that in the UK three people will be admitted to hospital due to cardiovascular disease. It will account for five deaths and cost the UK Health Service approximately £250,000. One potential approach to identify the early signs of cardiovascular disease is through the use of wearable devices, such as a wrist-worn device like that shown here. Wearables are now capable of monitoring a range of physiological parameters, which makes them potentially useful in several clinical applications. And we could go round the circle again. So there's great potential for wearables to be used to identify cardiovascular disease. To introduce myself, my name's Peter Charlton. I'm a researcher at the University of Cambridge and I work alongside clinicians, such as those at St Thomas's Hospital shown here, to develop signal processing techniques for wearables to extract physiological parameters from the signals they measure. Whilst I started working in a hospital environment, I now focus on uh, the use of wearables in daily life. In this talk, I'll cover three areas. Firstly, I'll give an overview of the fundamentals of photoplethysmography. Secondly, I'll outline some promising cl clinical applications. And thirdly, I'll give a few ideas of areas for future research. So, the fundamentals of photoplethysmography. Wearable photoplethysmography devices have been developed in two settings, the clinical and consumer settings. Photoplethysmography was first conceived in the 1930s when researchers noticed uh, that the shape of the pulse wave contains much physiological information. It took about half a century for photoplethysmography to enter clinical use in the form of pulse oximeters for oxygen saturation monitoring. And since then, consumer devices have become available which use photoplethysmography for heart rate monitoring and other purposes. The photoplethysmogram is measured using a sensor, in this case at the wrist, um, which taking a cross-section through the wrist, shines light onto the surface of the skin, uses a light sensor to measure the amount of light reflected back from the skin, and then uh, measures the photoplethysmogram signal, which exhibits a pulse wave for each heart beat. Here's an example at a slower heart rate. So as the blood enters and leaves the circulation with each heart beat, uh, this produces a pulse wave. In arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation, we observe irregular pulse waves where both the interbeat intervals and the pulse wave amplitudes vary from one beat to the next. The pulse wave contains a wealth of physiological information. Here are a few of the features that can be identified in the pulse wave and these change both between young and elderly subjects shown here in blue and red and also with cardiovascular physiology. This plot shows how the average pulse wave shown in black in each plot changes when the uh, parameter increases shown in red or when it decreases shown in blue. So you can see how heart rate, stroke volume and several other parameters affect the pulse wave shape. The photoplethysmogram is also influenced by breathing in three ways, baseline wonder, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. The shape of the pulse wave varies between different measurement sites. So for instance, comparing the wrist to the finger, here is a cross-section through the wrist 
where it's clear that a sensor mounted on the upper side of the wrist is situated a long way from the major arteries on the lower side of the wrist, so it probably primarily measures microvascular blood flow, whereas a sensor at the finger can be mounted very close to the main arteries of the finger, so it could be influenced by strong, more strongly by arterial blood flow. The signal is also influenced by the wavelength of light which is used to obtain the signal, the choice of transmission versus reflectance photoplethysmography, the sensor geometry, the contact pressure and the sensor attachment. Having obtained a signal, the next step is to process it. And I'll take you through the five steps which are traditionally taken to process PPG signals. Firstly, the signal is filtered to eliminate unwanted frequency content. Low frequencies are eliminated, so here we go from the raw signal in blue to the uh, red signal where low frequencies have been eliminated. And also high frequencies are eliminated, here zooming in on one pulse wave. Having filtered the signal, we can assess its quality to identify high quality periods suitable for analysis. So here is shown a 40 second period of signal with a low quality segment in the middle shown in red and we might decide to use the high quality segment shown in blue for our analysis. Typically we then detect beats in the signal shown here with red dots which allows to identify individual pulse waves for analysis. So a pulse wave is shown in the top plot here. We then identify fiducial points on the pulse wave, such as the systolic and diastolic peaks, or points also on the first and second derivatives shown below. And from these points, we can then extract pulse wave features, such as the time delay between systolic and diastolic peaks, shown by delta t in the top plot. I'll give you a few examples of how this process is used to estimate physiological parameters. Firstly, estimating respiratory rate. Respiratory rate algorithms typically consist of three steps. Firstly, the extraction of respiratory signals, which is done by identifying fiducial points on the pulse wave, finding the baseline, finding the amplitudes and beat to beat intervals, and using these as surrogate respiratory signals, where ideally the signals exhibit one peak per breath. Having obtained one of these signals, we can then estimate respiratory rate from it at its simplest by counting the number of peaks over a period of time. And we can repeat this process for the three different respiratory modulations to produce three estimates shown in red. We can fuse them perhaps by taking the average shown in blue to obtain an estimate which in this case is closer to the reference in black than the original estimates. Next, heart rate. Heart rate is typically estimated through frequency domain analysis. This plot shows examples at rest whilst walking and whilst running, and they show the PPG signal in blue and the reference heartbeats in grey from the ECG. On the right hand side is the accompanying frequency domain analysis of these signals. And for the signal at rest, you can see that the PPG spectrum, shown in blue, uh, very, is very similar to the ECG spectrum in that they both contain uh, a peak at just over 1 hertz, which corresponds to the heart rate. In contrast, whilst walking, whilst both signals do contain a peak at about 1.5 hertz, the heart rate, um, the PPG signal contains higher peaks at lower frequencies. And so when we use this approach to estimate heart rate, it's important to ensure that we select the correct peak as the heart rate. 
Blood pressure. Blood pressure can be estimated in three ways from the PPG. Firstly, by using a single PPG pulse wave. Here, again, we identify fiducial points, extract a pulse wave feature, and then estimate blood pressure uh, from this feature using a model to convert the feature to a blood pressure. Secondly, we could have multiple PPG signals, one closer to the heart and one further away, and measure the pulse transit time between these signals and estimate blood pressure from that. Or thirdly, instead of having two PPG signals, we could have a PPG signal and another signal, which is indicative of the heart beating, such as the ECG. And here we can measure the pulse arrival time, the time between the heart beating and the pulse wave arriving, which can be used to estimate blood pressure. So here I've shown one approach to modeling, that's converting uh, a measurement into a physiological parameter. There are a few different approaches that have been taken for this step in the literature. And so this diagram summarizes different approaches to get from a pre-processed PPG signal on the left through to either a diagnostic category or an estimate of a physiological parameter on the right. So at the top is the traditional approach of extracting features, selecting the best features and then using these either for classification, shown with the support vector machine here, or for parameter estimation, shown with uh, regression here. More recently, deep learning has also been applied in PPG analysis, and this can take these features as an input, or it can take an image representation, such as a spectrogram shown here, or just a sample of the signal as an input. And these are versatile in that neural networks can both provide a diagnostic category or a parameter estimate. So that was estimating physiological parameters. And for more details of this and the fundamentals of photoplethysmography, I'd point you towards these two publications. So some promising clinical applications for wearable photoplethysmography devices. It's believed that if atrial fibrillation, AF, was adequately treated in England, then it would result in 2,000 lives being saved per year, 7,000 strokes being prevented, and 425,000 people would receive additional diagnoses of AF. The basis on which wearable photoplethysmography devices can be used to identify AF is as follows. Recall from earlier that in normal sinus rhythm we observe these regular pulse waves shown in the middle on the left, whereas in atrial fibrillation shown below on the left the interbeat intervals are irregular. So we use this difference to identify atrial fibrillation and a worked example is shown on the right. So on the right hand side we have a column corresponding to atrial fibrillation and a column corresponding to sinus rhythm with at the top of each the PPG signal with the beats detected in red and ECG signal below with the beats detected in black and then on the third line down, we have the interbeat intervals extracted from these two signals, the PPG in red and the ECG in black. And you can see that the interbeat intervals are similar between the two. And so perhaps we can use this information in a similar way uh, when derived from the PPG as one would use derived from the ECG. So taking the information from the PPG in red, we move on to the final step, which here is to represent the information in what's called a Poincaré plot. This plot shows the variability in interbeat intervals. So starting on the bottom right, here the interbeat intervals in sinus rhythm are all quite similar. There's less variability. And so on this plot of the current interbeat interval on the x-axis against the next interbeat interval, on the y-axis there's little spread of points. 
In contrast, on the left-hand side, the spread of points is greater because there's greater variability in the interbeat intervals. And so by uh, measuring the spread of these points, we can uh, have a go at identifying atrial fibrillation. And indeed, this approach has been used in recent studies, such as the Apple Heart study, which resulted in a reassuringly low alert rate, a high positive predictive value, and good coverage of over 100 days on average per individual. And the Fitbit Heart study has recently reported some of its results as well. We're contributing to this line of work, firstly, by making PPG beat detection algorithms available and benchmarking them so you can access our toolbox of algorithms here and also by conducting our own study to assess the performance and acceptability of wearables for detecting atrial fibrillation. We'll be enrolling older adults, half of whom have AF, and asking them to wear two wrist-worn devices, one to capture the ECG and one to capture the PPG and using a reference ECG chest patch. A second promising area for wearable photoplethysmography devices is in the identification of obstructive sleep apnea. And I'd point you towards these key publications on this topic. In the future, fitness trackers could potentially be used to track infectious diseases. And this has been shown with influenza influenza-like illness, where resting heart rate and sleep duration were used to uh, track the spread of influenza-like illnesses. And also with COVID-19, where heart rate, sleep and activity were used um, to identify potential COVID-19. Furthermore, fitness trackers could be used for cardiovascular risk assessment, such as by providing estimates of blood pressure, by assessing vascular age, the biological age of your arteries, and by assessing your body's response to exercise in daily life, such as the heart rate recovery after exercise, or um, the use of periods of walking as surrogates for six minute walk tests, which would usually be conducted in the clinical setting. For further information on both these clinical applications and several more, I'd refer you to these two publications. Finally, some potential areas for future research. I'd split future research into five categories. Firstly, optimising the hardware to provide the best possible PPG signals. Secondly, optimising signal processing algorithms to ensure that the parameters are as accurate as possible. Thirdly, um, developing analysis techniques to ensure that we provide clinically useful information from this mass of data that can be collected from wearables. Fourthly, uh, working on user acceptance, tailoring wearables towards the intended users to make them as acceptable as possible. And finally, identifying specific clinical applications where wearables could plausibly be used to improve health outcomes. I myself focus on the signal processing part. And uh, recently I've been uh, thinking about the process of establishing best practices for biomedical signal processing. And this is based on observations that much research focuses on developing signal processing algorithms. Less research compares the performance of different approaches, and so sometimes we don't know which approach is best. And also, algorithm source code is often not available, making it difficult to use approaches in devices. So perhaps a vision for this area um, would be firstly to establish, find out, the best approaches to key physiological signal processing tasks. Secondly, to implement these approaches in software suitable for use in devices. And then thirdly, to assess the utility of these approaches 
to validate them against reference measurements and then to assess their clinical utility for defined applications. And there are several pressing questions about this um, and there are definitely pros and cons to this and so uh, these are some areas for thought. Further information on this is available in our recent publication here. So to conclude, photoplepismography is now widely used in consumer devices, providing an opportunity to monitor cardiovascular health in daily life. Clinical applications are emerging, including detecting atrial fibrillation. And when used clinically, photoplepismography devices should be like a climbing rope, highly reliable, validated, and for specific purposes. May I thank you for your attention, point you towards my website and email address for further information, and the slides for this talk are available online, and point you towards the publications that I mentioned in the talk. Thank you.